Evening, y'all. How's it going? Welcome to our first lockdown live chat of 2021. We hope you guys had an awesome New Year's, even given the COVID lockdown pandemic situation, wherever you guys are. As usual, joined with my awesome co-host, uh, the man in <laughs> sepultura of man, the leader of all things Dracona Media, Mr. Alec Larson. How's it going? Yeah, no, it's all good, man. Uh, you can see I'm sitting in the, the dark um, and it's not by choice. It's not to look all like edgy because of, you know, metal. Um, it's because, yeah, <laughs> we won't get into any political things. So, yeah, it, we all understand why I'm sitting in the dark. Which actually, I could not think of a better segue to get into the band because we're talking about neo-political. We're talking about being a little bit edgy in terms of government and whatnot. So what better, better guess to have than our first hardcore grindcore guest, Behest. We are joined today with Nicholas on folks. We got on guitars, we got Greg, Patrick on drums, and on bass, we got Byron. Welcome, guys. Thanks so much. Man. Hi, guys. Oh, doing well, doing well. Happy we can make this work. Happy to have our first unique genre based band on the chat. So, yeah, I guess let's kind of get right into it, um, seeing that that's what hardcore is all about. So, Nick, yeah, hardcore. It's a rather underground uh, genre, uh, especially here in South Africa, more so even when it comes to places like Cape Town. So with that in mind, I mean, how did all the members of Behesk meet each other? How did, how did this band come into fruition? Uh, yeah, I guess that's a bit of a long story, but <laughs> yeah, it's actually a really long story. It was always kind of like, I think I had started it with uh, another drummer at the time that turned into guitarist and Patrick joined as the drummer and then we kicked off the guitarist and then Greg and another bassist joined and then Greg stayed. And then for a really long time, we were just a three piece. Um, our first EP, we did um, just the three of us. And uh, the guy that recorded us, um, Dean Bailey, he, uh, he actually played bass on that, on that EP for us because we didn't have a bassist. And then probably a little bit after we had released the, the EP, uh, Byron hit us up and was like, hey, you know, I'd love to play bass for you guys. We were like, how's this, you know? Um, so, I mean, Byron's been in like the hardcore scene for like probably forever. Hey, Byron. Um, yeah, yeah in, one shape, in, one, in one shape or another, you know, uh, he's been, it's, you know, and uh, yeah, so like, there's no one better to to have uh, for that spot than than Byron. So yeah, it's 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 been cool. Yeah, so it's kind of just all worked out. But yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Like growing up and you, you're a kid and you start seeing live music for the first time, and always seeing Nick at shows and then seeing Nick performing, and then down the line like meeting him and linking up like this is like it's been really good, man. Right? Yeah, Sick. Yeah. Uh, that's cool. I'm going to direct my first question to Greg. Um, in your bio, it says that Behest has a range of influences such as thrash, punk, black metal, and doom. You can kind of hear a little bit of all those elements in your, your three-track EP. Um, as the guitarist, like, who are some of your major influences with this, like, and what made you go into the like hardcore grindcore sort of scene? Um, <clears throat> yo, I'd even just start off where I even kicked into hardcore scene in the first place. So back in PE, someone came up to me, and that's where I lived before Cape Town. So someone there was like, "Yo, let's do a cover band of Every Time I Die." And uh, I was interested, but I had no idea on what hardcore was. I didn't know how the rhythms went or anything. I was just like clueless with the stuff. And then I moved to Cape Town and um, 
from there, I um, bumped into this guy, Bradar, and he like introduced me to all these cool hardcore bands and he wanted to jam some hardcore, so I jammed a bit with him. And uh, via that, I ran into another guy that knows another guy, you know how it goes, and I bumped into this good soul, Nick and Patrick. And from there, they kind of helped me like structure the way I write. So they were like a big influence on the way the songs were written. Like I can write many forms of metal, but I don't know how to structure the stuff. So they were like, they helped me grow into that hardcore process of writing and stuff. But yeah, like uh, with influences and stuff, I just listen to like a ton of death metal bands. I don't really listen to hardcore. So yeah, it's, it's, it's everything I listen to pretty much just kind of try to be made into hardcore in a way. Sick. That's, that's always, that's always the ironic thing. Uh, like a lot of the time, like the bands uh, will like might make a, a, a genre of music that is completely against what they actually listen to in their normal passive listening time you know so yeah, yeah. I, can, I can understand that but uh, but actually delving a little bit more into like the themology and whatnot i mean we can actually i had a look at the definition of what behest actually was and it's simply an authoritative order so yeah an authoritative order so with that in mind, um, Nicholas, maybe you can answer this. Do you consider yourself to be a bit of an anarcho-punk band in, in, in the band's ethos? And I guess maybe a second part to that, where do you take your lyrical inspiration? Um, I mean, no, I mean, there's, there's, no, um, there's no real uh, weird, uh, like sort of agenda behind the, behind the lyrics or the music. Uh, per se from like a lyrical perspective like each song is like it, well, for me is like kind of unique and uh, maybe what I'm talking about um, so it's like it ranges from like uh, just you know being angry about uh, uh, you know losing a friend or uh, a relationship or dealing with old uh, older relationships or friendships and stuff like that and then sometimes i'll go into things that maybe for me it's like my own like you know views on 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 the world at large you know be it about like social media or about um about politics but i never i never try to be like on the nose with it i mean lyrically this what i'm saying isn't always it's, it's a little bit more underneath the surface. I, I try to be like as ambiguous as I can kind of thing. I don't, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of like the way that I, I do it. So like maybe someone else uh, listening to the songs or if they can, you know, they read the lyrics. I mean, they might interpret it like in a completely different way. And that's kind of how I grew up with music, you know? So I've always enjoyed uh, kind of discerning it or making up what I wanted to be at the end of the day, you know, when I, you know, listen to like Sepultura back in the day, I might have interpreted one of like their songs as being political, but for, for them, they were like, no, that's not even a political song, but it doesn't matter. You know, it's like, yeah. Well, to me, that's, it, it doesn't matter, but yeah. yeah. Sick. Um, I'm going to direct this to Byron. Generally, yeah. like, um, hardcore and grindcore have like a very DIY sort of approach to things. <laughs> Um, like if I could give an example, like if you look at like groin and album artwork, it's like stuff stuck together. Um, so it's like that and normally production is quite DIY as well. Is that sort of like an ethos that you guys in the Hest sort of subscribe to or I, I, uh, I love that. So, I mean, with the question that was directed at Nick previously, just with uh, the kind of uh, the band's kind of viewpoint and thinking like politically and all that sort of thing. But um, something that ties in with that is uh, when I first came into the band, like the DIY ethics and kind of looking at where Pat, where he started like in his early days, like drumming, he, he played drums in a straight edge hardcore band in Germany. And it's like, I, 
like that was in your teens, eh, Pat? Yeah, started in my teens. Like, I mean, from way back then, like guys kind of coming like together from all over the place. Um, I mean, Greg's from PE. Nick and I grew up around here, and we've known each other for years. But just like that side of the punk DIY ethics, like I kind of saw that in the band, like straight off the bat. And um, I love with the artwork, uh, like any of the, like whether it's stickers or t-shirts or whatever, like Nick is an incredible artist and he's just like pumping our work and we will, we'll, we'll like show us something he's working on. I'll just like blow our mind. So it's like, I love how much, um, the dudes in the band like will like handle what we got it's not like cool uh we have to get like a label involved and like you know like a lot of stuff is managed with the guys and you wouldn't have it any other way because you just like like the, the best guys for the job you know uh i don't know if i kind of missed the the question there but no you nailed but, yeah. it it's perfect, it's I, I perfect. Love, like i honestly love seeing what these guys get up to like the ideas and everything and um it's really inspiring. Yeah. Well, I actually, I did have a, a, a question set for Pat, but we're going to actually hold that out for a, for a second. Um, I'm, Cause I actually want to like lead in uh, with what we were just talking about. Nick, you, you're a senior designer, art director in real life. Um, yeah. In terms of, in terms of the band's visual image, um, and and how it tra uh, translates to the music uh, itself. How important is that to you uh, for the visual and the audio to kind of be synced? Um, yeah, I mean, not to like be like weirdly pretentious about like heavy music and stuff like that, but I do feel like that it lends to like, for me, it's like this whole thing is like an artistic, like sort of, uh, sort of expression for me and for us, you know, it's like, um, you know, we don't we don't have to play super aggressive music. We're not we're not even like super aggressive guys. But from that, uh, you know, when you're creating this type of, type of music, it's like I always kind of think of it as uh, wanting like a visceral, emotional response, whatever it might be. Like, however someone wants to feel that or interpret it, be they they turned off by it or they turned on by it or what have you. I, I kind of want the the visuals and everything to tie in with that as well. So, um, you know, that 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 aesthetic is important to me, but at the same time, it's like, I'm not taking it super seriously, but it's like, it's fun to explore and to build up a um, like a visual style that marries with the sort of audio style that we've created and what we enjoy, you know, kind of thing. So when I'm making something, I'm always, putting in front of the other guys to be like, is this cool? Do you guys dig it? Is this like a cool vibe kind of thing? And um, luckily they're very, very positive <laughs> with me and like my ideas. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah. No, no, good, good stuff. Good stuff. Well, yeah, let's actually dive a little bit into the percussion. So yeah, I mean, uh, Pat, as, uh, as the guy said, you've actually performed in other bands lot of like pertaining to hardcore obviously when it comes to hardcore and grindcore bands in general a lot of it has to be driven by the by the performance uh, that's where a lot of the fuel ends up coming from as far as creativity so obviously now during a lockdown we kind of hit a little bit of a brick wall as far as any live performances goes so in terms of that how does that affect you uh, affect the band um the fact that you guys can't per, can't practice as much, um, don't have any gigs uh, in the cards. How's that like uh, work in terms of getting inspiration for music? Um, well, um, so in terms of the band and, and not being able to practice, um, we actually practiced like, when was it? Like three months ago or so, I think, two months ago. Um, and that was basically after kind of like seven, eight months without a practice, right? Um, and it was actually unexpectedly good. <laughs> so we, we got back into, into the songs uh, pretty like quickly. Um, so that's really cool. I didn't really practice 
uh, during during lockdown because I just don't have the the the, the possibility to practice. You know, um, I don't have the drum set at home uh, and stuff. I mean, I drum on my you know on my legs quite often and stuff. But um, yeah, so I guess we'll only um, catch up with that like once things go back to normal. Uh, but otherwise, what you said. Um, regarding inspiration, I mean, I, I definitely have been listening to a lot more music during lockdown. Um, so I can feel like when, you know, there's like a quiet moment, there's actually quite a lot of stuff coming up in my head, you know, like rhythms or like riffs or, or whatever it is, you know. Um, so I guess that will be helpful um, once we start practice, practicing again, you know, in the rehearsal, yeah. Cool. You actually answered my next question. I was going to ask you about um, practicing drums during lockdown. So I'm going to actually rephrase my sort of, or come up with a new one. And I wanted to ask you about drum production for your EP and for any recordings that you do. Um, what do you guys do in terms of your drum sound? Because I know like a lot of modern metal bands, like program drums, some guys have electronic kits, some guys use acoustic kits. So I wanted to sort of get your approach. Yeah, uh, good question, yeah. Um, also it ties in, for me personally, it ties in with, with the question um, you answered, um, you asked earlier about DIY. Um, so for me, it's like um, this type of music has to sound um, like natural. You know, I'm, I'm not a fan of like, um, like triggered uh, drum sounds and stuff like that. Um, I, I rather prefer it like, not necessarily dirty, but you know, so that you can hear that it's like an, an, an actual drum kit, you know. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's pretty much for the, for the entire band. You know, we, we've always tried to have like a not like a too clean sound, you know. It needs to it needs to sound a bit dirty. Um, when it's about the timing, I guess we all kind of like agree that <laughs> that we um, that we want to have like a proper timing, you know. But when it comes to sound, um, then definitely uh, I definitely prefer like a natural and raw sound on the drums and also on the on the guitars and the bass. And, yeah. Cool. So. Uh, to answer your question, like I play a normal drum set. Um, they're not triggers. Um, we, we obviously like, you know, fine tune the, um, the sounds um, during the mixing process, um, but there's not necessarily a, like an artificial, like, part. Yeah. Cool. Definitely. In the, in, in the few times uh, that I've seen you in the short period, uh, like the one, feeling that I've always gotten from you guys is that you're very organic. It's very, it's like the rage and the angst and the aggression live is real. And you can almost feel that in terms of the, the three track EP that you guys put out. It isn't very much different from what you would get in a live setting. It's just kind of dialed up to 100 when it's live. So I guess, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll direct my question then with that in mind. Um, because we would not have had you guys on unless you guys did have a little bit of uh, useful tips and info and treats to tell us. So, Greg, in terms of uh, writing this Much Ado album, uh, how, how's that going? How's the, the writing process been going on this much-anticipated debut album? Um, chill, man. <laughs> like, I actually don't <laughs> write at home and stuff. I actually, whenever we practice, with like the last five seconds we have of practice, we'll try a smash in a rough. And some, somehow that always succeeds. And <laughs> we've actually got some of our best riffs from those five, last five seconds of practice. So yeah, like, uh, like I said earlier, it's just uh, Nick and Pat, they help me a lot with like choosing riffs and the way we write and you know, all, all that. Well, it's quite often that you actually bring like riffs in into the rehearsal, you know, 
and that's kind of like the starting point quite often as well you know and then we just jam with that riff and and you know take it from there nick has a lot of input as well usually and um you know yeah yeah, we just um, always, always, always make, always tell people the story of exactly what Greg said is that it's a lot of our, a lot of our songs were never over contrived. We just, we were like, we, we started practice and we just rehearse what we have basically. And then by the, you know, we, we take it pretty chill. We maybe have like about a two hour, two hour practice usually. And that's like once a week. And then um, probably like, yeah, we'd be like, hey, we've got five minutes left. I'm like, Greg, that riff that you're playing just now, let's make a song from that. And then somehow, some way, it just, it, because we don't have any, we're not really putting any pressure on ourselves. It just turns into this thing. And I think what helps so much with the four of us is that um, we're, we're so in tune in terms of like um, musical sensibilities, in terms of we kind of understand what we're all trying to, gun for in terms of like our sound and like um you know the the violence and the music and stuff like that so we kind of we kind of like you kind of organically feel it out and and sometimes there's like songs that we've thrown away that just we just didn't feel like super strongly about so we we're okay with just you know pushing that aside and just moving forward you know and i think that's been kind of our recipe um for everything really um and yeah yeah. sick sick i'm gonna um go ahead and direct this last question to to byron um hi yeah uh what tuning do you guys play in like and what kind what gear do you use as your as the bassist of the band oh man um drop a shot and uh yeah when when I initially, Greg was the first person I spoke to. Um, he said, my band's looking uh, for a bassist. And I'd never met him at that point. And then, so early on, he's told, he just told me what kind of tuning they played in. And I, I just have like a standard like P bass, like four string. I was like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to do about this tuning, guys. <laughs> I've never played like that down tune before. So, uh, yeah, man, uh, I think Greg and I have had quite a, quite uh, an interesting journey uh, just with um, our instruments and having them handle that kind of low, low tuning. <laughs> I think uh, his, uh, he was borrowing some strings off a, a bass, like, on his guitar, just so it could be, like, super fat, like, to the top string, right? Yeah, I use the bottom <laughs> bass string. <laughs> Crazy, man. So, like, I usually just buy a, a five-string set and then I, I just drop the skinniest string and have that on my bass. Um, I mean, the pickups, like, sound great how they are. I mean, it's not, like, the best <laughs> best bass for, like, down, down-tuned music. But, yeah. Um, it has then, a much uh, necessary fuzz. <laughs> yeah, uh, Greg's guitar tone is incredible, man. Uh, for his riffs, like, I mean, it's that Swedish uh, chainsaw tone, and then um, I just went with like a like a distortion that would kind of keep the low end and like work with his guitar tone. And um, everyone else was like, "Yeah, that's working." So we just kind of like smiling and carrying on, you know. <laughs> it's like. Yeah, if if you can hear it in the mix with uh, like Nick's vocals and Pat's like super aggressive, like super hard drumming, mm. somehow it all balances out. Like, <laughs> like n none of the sounds cancel each other out, and it just sounds like like we wanted to. Like, it's pretty good. I love it. Um, Sick. Sick. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but uh, I think there's probably yeah. like other specialized gear that will hand like you know it's not like we're playing like eight strings or seven strings like we just like greg's rocking a six string, a string guitar like down to tune or, like i'm rocking a four string bass like works out yeah as long as you're making noise that's all that matters yeah 100 <laughs> guys and it's um, 
Thanks so much. I'm just uh, I'm just wondering um, to try wrap this uh, up uh, like kind of like a brutal ending. Nicholas, any final thoughts given this pandemic? What the future holds for Behest? You got one minute. <laughs> one minute. Uh, so just to quickly get this in, a little plug is that the the album's going to be split up into into a couple of EPs. I think we got I think it's like fourteen songs we have. Uh, they're all really short, um, so instead of releasing a full album, we've, we've had a lot of time to think about this and decided that given the state of things and not being able to play uh, shows, and we don't know when we're going to be able to play shows again, uh, is to just sort of like break it up and sort of release those uh, throughout the year and um, use that as a sort of like way to, you know, get people to hear us, you know, um, so we have more to work with essentially, so yeah, that's that's the plan for us going forward this year. Um, yeah. Awesome. We can't wait to hear it. We can't wait to hear it.